I am Zunaira Azhar and you're watching Epicenter where we dissect, analyze and help understand major domestic and global stories. The issue of judicial independence has resurfaced in Pakistan's political landscape once again, sparking intense discussions. This time, the focus is on uh, explosive letters being sent to the Supreme Judicial Council uh, by the judges themselves and the stakeholders are brainstorming ways to protect the judiciary from undue influence. There is a flip side to it though. Uh, there is a debate on how the judiciary can learn from its own past mistakes as extreme judicial activism uh, has led to a series of crises even in the recent past, resulting in the dismissal and disqualification of elected officials. Uh, the question now is, what is different this time in this debate? And how can we break this cycle of failures in our democratic process? We will delve into this discussion shortly, but let's watch this short report on the major domestic events of the week. Like Panama leaks, another leaks blasted the national and international news by the name of Dubai Unlocked. Several prominent Pakistanis have been named in this leaked data containing details of individuals who own properties in the upscale areas of Dubai. The list includes political figures, former military officials, bankers and bureaucrats. The combined value of properties owned by Pakistanis has been estimated at around $11 billion. Among the Pakistanis listed in the property leaks are President Asif Ali Zardari's three children, Hussein Nawaz Sharif, Interior Minister Mohsin Naqvi's wife, Sharjeel Maimon and family members, Senator Faisal Wada, Farah Gogi, Sher Afzal Marwat, four members of the National Assembly and half a dozen members of the Sindh and Balochistan Assemblies. This list also features the late General Pervez Musharraf, former Prime Minister Shaukat Aziz, and more than a dozen retired generals, as well as a police chief, an ambassador, and a scientist, all of whom owned properties either directly or through their spouses and children. Defense Minister Khaja Muhammad Asif, through the social media platform X, dismissed these leaks saying all those named in the data were already known to have properties abroad. Explaining his position on the issue, Pakistan's Interior Minister Mohsin Naqvi said that Dubai property bought in his wife's name in 2017 was fully declared and listed in tax returns. Pakistan Tehreeke Insaf's lawmaker Sher Afzal Marwat admitted that he owned an apartment in Dubai but had declared it with authorities in Pakistan. President Zardari of Pakistan People's Party also said that the properties of his party members in Dubai leaks had been fully declared in tax returns. The appearance of founder PTI in the NAB amendments case was also in the headlines this week. The most discussed aspect of this hearing was that it was not broadcasted live, which has become a norm ever since the new Chief Justice has taken charge. What became even bigger a news was the PTI's founder's leaked photo from this hearing that went viral on the social media. An investigation has been initiated by the administration to find out who leaked this picture that later went viral. In another major development this week, founder PTI, the incarcerated former Prime Minister of Pakistan, was granted bail in the famous £190 million reference. The Islamabad High Court granted bail in the NAB filed Al Qadir Trust case, in which Khan and his wife were indicted. However, it seems highly unlikely that he or his wife would be released from the prison anytime soon. Let me introduce uh, to you the guests for this part of the show. 
We have with us uh, Mr. Amir Ghori, who is a senior journalist and political analyst. We also have with us Mr. Musaddiq Malik, who is Federal Minister for Petroleum. Uh, we have with us uh, Barrister Ahmed Pansota, who is a law expert. And we also have the honor of having with us Justice Retired Shaikh Usmani, who is former Chief Justice of Sindh High Court. Welcome, gentlemen, all to the show, and thank you so much for joining me. Uh, Mr. Wari, I'll start with you. I believe, this is my opinion, that there is a concerning pattern emerging in Pakistan where we see either extreme judicial activism taking place uh, with an overdose of Suomoto, I would say, or there is a noticeable alignment of the judiciary with a specific political faction or the establishment. If the judiciary itself fails to adhere to its constitutionally framed role, how can we expect other institutions to do so? Thank you very much, uh, Janera, for uh, you know, taking me in your program. I think your question, your question has uh, you know, different layers to it. Uh, if I can uh, deal with uh, the first one, you know, first, uh, I think you know, the question, the way we uh, report judiciary and judicial cases uh, in the courts these days, uh, that has a, a particular pattern. And media mainly focuses on what it understands to be the most important or the most sought after subject. Uh, there are many thousand cases uh, are being heard in Pakistani courts, whether they are lower courts or high courts. But uh, if you pick up the newspapers uh, or listen to the news bulletins, news about uh, you know, the former Prime Minister Imran Khan and his wife, you know, take the precedence. Uh, and since he's, he's facing multiple charges and there are multiple cases, so definitely, you know, two thirds of the front pages would, uh, you know, try to deal with him and his cases. Uh, no, this is not new. Uh, it used to be when uh, Nawaz Sharif was uh, facing similar situation and uh, similarly, you know, earlier uh, politically. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the question which you actually asked, I, I think uh, the Pakistani courts are not uh, that interested in sewer motor notices these days as they used to be, you know, a few years ago. Mm -hmm. But I think you know, the, the way Pakistani politics is uh, developing, uh, there is a sense that uh, maybe, you know, the most powerful institution in this country, the establishment, uh, the way it has conducted itself over the last 20 years, and maybe, you know, b before that as well, slowly the political space for other institutions uh, was reduced. And definitely there is a blowback to it. Uh, mm -hmm. And that is why, you know, the, the cases which are now the, the Supreme Court and the, the High Court in Islamabad are listening that, uh, listen, they, they think that somebody is uh, watching them and watching them illegally, uh, and they do not like it. Reason is that, you know, the the, Pakistan, the major pa Pakistani political parties, whether it's Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz or Pakistan People's Party, and now recently Pakistan uh, Tariq and Saab, Tariq and Saab. have been, you know, uh, hard done by the institution. Uh, at least there is a feeling among them. Uh, whether they will speak uh, openly about it, I think many of them are speaking. And, uh, you know, in, in drawing room talks, that is the only subject. So I think uh, there is a feeling now that uh, if institutions have to work together, all the leading institutions, the, the stakeholders, they will actually have to abide by the rules and the regulations, what is written in the constitution, what is described in the laws. And if, uh, you know, one institution think that it is too important or too powerful than the others, there will be a problem. And that is the problem which we are facing and some of the lawyers, uh, you know, and mostly some of the judges have spoken about it. Uh, at early stage, it, you know, we need to you know, sit back and see how this uh, whole process develops and how we basically get to the end of it. Right. Um, Mr. Shai Kusmani, you've listened to what Mr. Gauri has said, and rightly so, as the political developments change and whatever direction they take, somehow the judicial system also takes a leaning. Is this a correct observation? What the gentleman said, uh, you see, there has been a great change in the way the judiciary behaves now or as it did previously. Tremendous amount of change. In the earlier days, the judges were very aloof. They were never mixed with anybody. They hardly ever expressed any opinion about political matters. Uh, they never met anybody. They just... They never even talked in the courts, in fact. I mean, they would only uh, ask questions, and that is all. No talks back and forth, as it happens today. So their aloofness made them uh, create a kind of an awe. 
for, and that is the result why, that is the reason why people did not have the courage to approach them or talk about them. But what has happened in the recent True. past is that the judges have become, unfortunately, populists in the sense that they are now they have access to the social media and they also meet more frequently with other people, which they didn't do before. Besides, uh, the problem that has arisen in Pakistan is because of the dominance of one particular institution in the country. Uh, most people, particularly the politicians, who are always quarreling with each other, the most politicians find that the only solution to their problem lies in approaching the judiciary, because mm-hmm. that is the only institution which can say something and get away with it. And other, legitimize it. And, and leg- legitimize it also. And also, and get away with it, you see, because yeah. the other institutions, anybody else says anything, is really of no consequence. So because of that reason, the judges were dragged into the political disputes and that is where the trouble began, and that is where the deterioration of judiciary began in, in our country. Mm-hmm. And as a result, you find now that uh, most of the time in the courts, you find uh, it's political cases which are taken up quickly, and decisions are given on that, whereas the problems of the people which the judiciary is supposed to solve, the disputes amongst the people which the judiciary is supposed to deal with, is not being done. Mostly it's the political matters which come up, and yeah. the political matters also carry a lot of more, uh, uh, in the sense, there is a lot of uh, talk about it in the press and the social media and other places. So the populist character of the judges becomes more and more prominent, and, and they begin to actually enjoy the function of deciding the political matters. And that is, right. what, has, that is what has destroyed the judiciary's uh, caliber and ju- the way the judiciary used to behave. And Absolutely. That, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Barrister Ahmed Pansota, uh, you must be listening to what uh, Justice Shaikh has said, and rightly so. Judges are not supposed to be populist. They shouldn't be getting mixed with the political developments and happenings and the opinion makers and all that, what is happening. Do you think that is part of the problem, or the problem lies uh, with the domination of certain institutions and the way judges are appointed? Is it the politicization of the judiciary, the process of appointing the judge, that is the problem? Well, I'll have to partly agree with what uh, Justice Shaikh just said, but I think that the the factors that lead to judges falling into such decisions and then making such poor decisions at times is, is primarily because of several factors. First being the process of appointment. I personally have been a strong uh, opponent of this process because it is very, very clearly hand-picking, cherry-picking, and the people that that particular chief justice of the time wants to appoint. And then, of course, there's a process which is then followed. I believe, I am of the view, the way judges are appointed in the United States, there should be a Senate hearing. There should be some sort of a hearing where people can come up with complaints against that particular person. Some scrutiny, and then that at co- least. Exactly, some scrutiny. Secondly, as far as the political decision making is concerned, I think another very important aspect is that there is absolutely no training imparted to these judges from day one till the time they retire. Every other institution in the country has to go through a process of training. In this particular context, you're a practicing lawyer and one fine morning you find out that you've been elevated and from that day onwards till you retire, there is no formal training. And these trainings are not meant to teach you law or to make you aware of the legal subject, but then there are, let's say, artificial intelligence laws, then there are internet laws, all of these things are developing. And you don't expect a lawyer or any lawyer to sort of make themselves uh, abreast with the latest and also to give certain amount of training. Then comes the part of uh, the oath itself. They Mm -hmm. have been administered oath to defend the constitution and apply the law and letter and spirit, regardless of what the situation is. But over the last maybe 30, 40 years, if if you examine the judicial history of Pakistan, there has always been the necessity, which has, you know, sort of come in front of every other factor in in, in this country. So then that leads to poor decision making, poor decision making, which involves politics and which, of course, involves jurisdictions such as sumo jurisdiction. In the end, what happens is that the the decisions that we are looking at may be good decisions in terms of necessity, but they're certainly not decisions which are in line with the legal principles or the constitution of Pakistan. Now, this is where it creates problems. Then 
there is a political party. You see, every political party has a right to be, uh, you know, political and conduct politics. So when they do politics, there is a certain part of that judgment that they will disagree with. And then they will comment. Once they comment, then every judge will want to sort of defend himself and wants his chief justice to sort of come to his rescue. So my question is that the jurisdiction that most of the judges are exercising in Pakistan at high court and Supreme Court level, which is the constitutional jurisdiction, must be sparingly exercised when it involves a question of political importance. This political right. importance question and doctrine is something that must be, you know, that must be avoided at all cost. Right. Okay. Let me go back to Mr. Amir Wari. Uh, five parliamentarians attacking the judiciary all of a sudden. What is happening in your opinion? So, Nira, this is, this is not new again. You know, some of the important points which uh, Jasar Susmani has uh, dealt with and also, you know, my friend Pansota has mentioned. You know, here, when uh, the cases which are important or deemed important uh, politically uh, are uh, listened to with uh, great haste, you know, that creates a problem. And mm -hmm. why? Because, you know, uh, the way they are reported in the media uh, it has also something to do with it. Uh, and that is why, you know, when you look at the media, uh, you know, how Pakistanis are listening or reading it, uh, and, you know, nothing else is uh, happening in this country but, you know, politicization, politics, political debate. Uh, and then with, with the advent of uh, the social media, it seems, you know, every Pakistani is so politically alive or wants to be politically alive and then want to express him or herself. Uh, and, and too opinionated. They're not expressing, they're criticizing. Yeah. Uh, this is this has come down to this level where, you know, the moment, uh, you know, some, some observation is made during the hearing of a case, uh, soon you will find them running as stickers on television screens. So you know, decisions are not more important than, you know, what has become more important is the personal opinions during the hearing of a case. Uh, if those hearing, you know, those uh, opinions might not basically, basically reflect themselves in, mm -hmm. in the of the case but this is the way we are reporting it and that's why when you listen to important cases and uh, the way i mentioned earlier most of the cases are about imran khan and his wife yeah if, uh, pakistan the way pakistan is behaving towards judges and these cases uh, I, I think this is unnatural uh, and this is a sad state of affair and then if, well. if you throw in the melee the other, you know, relationship with the most powerful institution in this country, the way it conducts itself, you know, uh, you, then you have a perfect war here. Well, uh, we would continue the debate, but we would start from here that the basic barometer for the judiciary or for the judges was to stay private, stay away from the social media, stay away from whatever politically is happening. That is not happening. But at the same time, if there is a problem, where that problem lies is, in my opinion, is between the institutions, because the statecraft doesn't uh, go in an isolation. It doesn't happen in an isolation. It's a cohesion of judiciary, parliament, and executive. If there is a problem, why don't they talk to each other and go back to their constitutional domains rather than keep coming back to the media after a short break? Stay with us. Welcome back to Epicenter once again, and we have been joined by Mr. Musaddiq Malik, who is Federal Minister for Energy, Petroleum and Water Resources. Thank you so much, Mr. Malik, for joining us. I'll quickly jump to the question. We are, dis we are discussing uh, this recent judicial activism, let's call it activism here, and the crisis that it is facing as well. Uh, where do you think politicians are wrong? Because politicians keep on taking their matters to judiciary judiciary keeps on entertaining it and this is how they overstep their own domains who is at fault here a uh, number of issues that you're discussing first of all i think the society overall is extremely polarized and that level of polarization is not limited to the political apparatus or to the politicians i think is extended all the way into the judiciary as well so if you mm -hmm. look at recently over the past couple of years, if you look at how judiciary has shown its own fractures, how one set of uh, judges have <clears throat> kind of said, I would say, pretty critical things about other set of judges, 
in terms of how judges should behave and they should not appear to be political actors or political do political activism so on and so forth these things were not said by politicians these things were said by honorable judges about each other similarly you've seen many a times when judges have complained whether it be justice sadiqi or the high court judges more recently they basically have also complained about various kinds of ingresses and and that conversation is also ongoing in the courts as far as uh, your second part of the question is concerned i think you're absolutely right i think um, because that fracture is also one has begun to see the same kind of polarization actually to a much larger extent uh, amongst the political parties so it's almost become impossible to have a reasonable reasoned or fair conversation um we have and obviously my view would be slightly biased and one sided but if you look at if you look over the past couple of years you would see that um shabash sharif as the leader of the opposition during imran khan's administration reached out and said we'd like to do uh, some kind of charter of economy with you we'd like to sit with you and support your economic policies and try to create stability in the country if you look at uh, what uh, bilawal bhutto sahab has been saying you'd hear the same he went out and said kadam badhao imran khan hum tumhare saath hain we are with you all the way especially mm-hmm. when the security of pakistan comes into question uh even when nawaz sharif uh, landed in pakistan he reached out and said a lot has happened and i've gone through a lot of pain but i'd like to put all of that behind me in public interest and in national interest and i'd like to reach out to all political parties to have a dialogue and he's been talking about the grand dialogue for a very long period of time ever since i've gotten into politics uh, and then when you know the gesture that uh, the prime minister uh, shabash sharif made when he offered uh, the sunni ittehad or pti to come and form their government and the and the gesture that people's party samajhi he made and said right. okay if you think you're in majority why don't you form the government and then in his first speech shabash sharif reached out again and said we'd like to have dialogue so in essence i've plus <laughs> i'm sorry and a little i've gone a little open you know overboard in giving you all of these examples the point is that we're trying to reach out and the reason why we're reaching out is because we want to depolarize and the reason why we want to depolarize is because many a times when we are unable to have these conversations these conversations then go to judiciary and when right. we invite but judiciary but mr malik one, but mr malik uh, let let me interject here Uh, you need to move on yourself first in order to reach out to other people it was just yesterday that mr nawaz sharif your supreme leader was again talking about the same stuff and he was right about it there is no other question about it that uh, dismissing and disqualifying prime ministers and parliamentarians this has become habit i would say um, in our judicial system but you have to move on we were we are still hearing there are audios and there are some stuff that he has off the previous chief justice you have to move on you have to go past that because you are in the government now so if you are reaching out and you are sticking to the sticking to the same rhetoric how would you move on but the rhetoric is about the same thing it's about doing truth and reconciliation is talking about all of the things that have gone wrong including things that we've done wrong in his previous conversations mila nawaz sharif has started from justice munif and malik ulam mohammed he has spoken about the shahadat or the judicial murder of uh, of of uh, mr puto and the assassination or shahadat of the nazis he spoken about them getting thrown out we getting thrown out he spoken about no prime minister ever finishing his term he has spoken about the ingress of judiciary he has spoken about the political parties playing cogs he saying let's come out let's talk about everything not in the way of vendetta but in the way of sitting together and moving forward but we have to recognize what has happened over our political history if you are unwilling to recognize what has happened over our political history then how are we going to move forward who exactly do you do? want to recognize who exactly are you pointing well, out we want to the judges or the establishment no 
everyone, every actor in the political history of Pakistan, including the politicians. Why let the politicians go free? Everyone should be brought forward. All the truth should come forward. We should put our heads together. We should resolve to move forward in our togetherness and sort out the affairs of the state. Think more about poverty. Think more about unemployment. Think more about the transparency in our political electoral process and our political processes so that we can move forward as a nation. We can only move forward if you shrug everything, if you brush everything under the carpet, then how will you right. move forward? Thank you so much. Thanks once again for joining us. Justice Shaikh, uh, you're listening to the whole conversation and as someone who has been part of the system, it is very easy uh, to move on and grapple a certain amount of freedom as a judge. It is difficult to step back. Do you think it's possible for the judges to step back a little from the public domain and the activism that comes with it? It is possible and there is no difficulty in that. All that is required to be done is first, don't let the press come to the courts. Let the registrar every day at the end of this hearing, the registrar make out a statement and give it to the press. Which other country, or I mean, I'm talking established democracy, do you have all these proceedings of the courts being reported the way they're reported in Pakistan? Nowhere else. You hardly ever hear of any judge's name in England or America or Australia or other True. Western democracies. You don't True. even know who the chief justice is. Here, everybody knows who is who, which judge is who. Now, this yeah. is something the judges have to be out of the political domain completely and absolutely. Once you achieve that, then you'll have more justice and you'll have better sense prevailing amongst the politicians also. Right. Ahmed, right. how difficult is that for the judges to say no to all political cases? No, they, they, don't, they don't have to say no to the political cases. Political cases will certainly come now and then. There will be disputes uh, which require their interference uh, to interpret a particular law or whatever. That, that always will be there. The point is that the way what happens today is uh, this also this started with uh, Iftikhar Chaudhary's times. Uh, what ha- started when you have these SMS had just begun, and you found that the journalists would be sitting in the court. I was there many times, and I saw the journalists uh, ticking away on the on the phones, <clears throat> uh, and 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 the the uh, uh, on on the TV you would see these uh, notes below uh, ticker tapes mentioning what the judge is saying. That yeah. is not required. That is not required. And then, of course, the judges must also control what they're saying. The judges, unfortunately, have now started becoming more flippant in their talk. Um, and that also then attracts the people and that leads to the so-called populist mode of the judges. So all the entire judiciary has to sit down and think and review the way the judges ought to behave. Okay, shortly, what do you think of this live streaming thing? I am absolutely against it. Because live streaming makes things worse, more so because then the judges tend to play to the gallery. They know that they're being watched by everybody around, and they tend to do things which they apparently would never do otherwise. So Mm -hmm. I think it's not a good idea at all. All right. All right. Ahmed, I'm coming to you, and I'm coming to you with a different question. I think we are very selective with what we want to portray as uh, a story for media or a story for judiciary, a case for judiciary or whatever. For example, Panama case or Panama leaks or Pandora leaks, they all caused a lot of legislation in most of the established democracies, most of the countries. Uh, They made sure there is no capital flight in their countries. There there is everything uh, when it comes to the public figures that is declared and all that. In our country, we only focused on one prime minister, and even that case was not pursued in its spirit. The outcome was very different. Now we see Dubai leaks being downplayed. So do you think we are very selective when it comes to our uh, 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 political developments, when it comes to the things that should be taken very seriously in the interest of the country? Do you see that happening, that it's being downplayed? The honest uh, case is ought to become selective the moment it is picked up by the highest court in the country in a sumoto jurisdiction. So let's say if you took up the case of the ex-prime minister as far as the corruption case is concerned, and then of course certain method was adopted, the question then begs that why was the or why were the cases 
that related to the other prime ministers or other politicians were not taken up in the same jurisdiction. This is exact. Exactly. The, this is the exactly problem with the super motor jurisdiction. Why? Because when you pick up a case, you are actually cherry picking or choosing. And when yeah. you choose, you are in effect, in effect, suspending his right to due process and a fair trial. So this is what happens. I'm not saying somebody was corrupt or somebody was not corrupt. So there is a, a process in the story. now. Exactly. So now the problem, the real problem is that the, the investigating agencies in Pakistan, A, they're not allowed to work. And even if they work, they work once again in a selective way. So once it comes through that machine of uh, the investigation process, and then it leads to trial, and then it goes to the other, uh, the, the superior courts of the country, it makes a lot of difference. Now, there is one point that I wanted to comment on. <clears throat> we are basically giving a lot of leeway to the judiciary in Pakistan. We don't want the media to cover them. We don't want other institutions to talk about them. But at the same time, we are not expecting them to behave in a certain manner that they're supposed to do as far as the constitution is concerned. So let's say, for the sake of argument, even if the media was sitting in court, but if a judge is consistently behaving in line with what is expected of him, media will have no story. But mm -hmm. suspending the media or any other agents to, to cover them, I think will also once again result in violation of their fundamental rights. So I expect a judge to behave in the manner that is prescribed for him. And of course, there will absolutely be no news. Now, the real problem is when they're hearing a case, they start making observations. I have requested time and again, if judges make observations, why can't they reduce them into their order sheet? Why? Mm -hmm. Because that will call for a case of misconduct. So this is this is the real problem. If they just keep quiet, I mean, I, I would like to name a judge in the history of Pakistan was Justice Iqbal Hamoud Rahman. We used to appear before him. He was quiet for an hour. And then he would say, okay, I will pass. And just judgment. listen. Because he was supposed to... Exactly. He was supposed to speak through his judgment. And absolutely, I have never seen a single media person sitting in his court because there was no news. And, and secondly, I would like to uh, quote a small instance. I had the opportunity of uh, interviewing Lord Canworth, the ex-Chief Justice uh, of the Court of Appeals in UK. And I asked him a question that, do you believe in judicial activism, adventurism? He was shocked at my question. He said, well, every judge is supposed to be active. I said, no, no, this is not what I'm asking. What I'm asking is, is he supposed to indulge in affairs the way it is uh, done in Pakistan? He completely disagreed. He said, that's not our job. Then why have you made the investigating agencies or the executive? The concept of separation of powers is something that is not being truly implemented. And that's not the only problem with judiciary. That's a problem that lies inherent with other institutions as well. The executive wants to become judiciary. Judiciary wants to become executive. Yeah, and then, you know, on all of them and overstepping each other. So if they yeah. go back to their domains and perform their tasks, because it is not, once again, the last comment, it is not a judge's job or a judge's task to think about what is going to happen because he's supposed to do justice, even the heavens fall. That is his concept. He is not supposed to worry about the outcome of what the media thinks, what the government thinks, Pakistan, you know, how will Pakistan take it? No, no. His job is to implement the code of conduct, behave in that way, and the constitution and the laws on the subject. And doesn't worry, he must not worry about the consequences that flow from that. Right. Uh, Mr. Gauri, my last question to you. I think we are all overstepping, let it be media, uh, let it be executive, the parliament, all institutions are overstepping or trespassing rather the constitution. Where do we even begin from to stop all this? Junaira, if we can, we need to kind of go back to 1958 when a subservient uh, officer, you know, thought uh, that he can basically do whatever he wants. And then, you know, if, for example, for 10 years, nobody stopped him, doing whatever. He changed the nature of Pakistani constitution, the way Pakistan used to kind of conduct politics. At that time, there was two Pakistans, you know, East and West. And we know what actually happened in 1971. Again, 1977, when Ziaul Haq, you know, walked in, subservient officer. We need to remember that an army chief is basically answerable to Secretary of Defense. And the Secretary of Defense is answerable to Defense Minister. And the Defense Minister is answerable to the Prime Minister. If we basically, you know, undo that balance, then this exactly situation what we are facing, it will not basically go away. It will not, we will not rectify the situation. I mm -hmm. think when we say that, you know, everybody has to basically live within the constitution and law, we need to understand the basic difference between constitution and law. Constitution is not meant for every day's debate. People do not understand what's the difference between constitution and law. Constitution is yeah. a run the state and then secondly you know if pakistani political parties had done one thing uh, over the years that they should have basically you know given safe seats to lawyers 
you know become if made made politics so interested for politicians because a lot of people you see sitting in the parliaments you don't understand what their job is you know you look at the the parliaments in america france england most of them are lawyers you know why because they are primarily tasked to create laws if you do not understand you know what the job is then you basically come here for a high level discussion and think that yeah. you are privileged to just sit in you know the highest uh, uh, you know room in 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 the country and just discuss politics no it is not and secondly you, you know uh, the uh, lastly what i would say that once the uh, institutions which think that they are powerful you know they need to understand they are to serve the people of pakistan in and the bar of, is their responsibility actually exactly people people are completely out of this process and that is why you know the the anger which is now uh, literally brewing on the streets i am absolutely really absolutely what happened in kashmir where there was no political leader involved but people basically took the law in their hands and then forced the government to take decisions which you know they wanted i think that is not the way pakistan should go ahead and pakistan and the second thing is you know uh, uh, what actually we see is the politicians and people in power for this same and exactly the opposite i think the difference between their saying and doing needs to be a yeah it's the mindset where you say that people are powerful but you don't accept it thank you so much mr amir gori so much barrister ahmed pansota and justice retired shaikh usmani with this we conclude our this part of the show and after the break we'll be moving on to our global story stay with us Welcome back to Epicenter once again and turning our attention to the major global story of the week we are faced with an ongoing genocidal conflict in Gaza a humanitarian crisis that the United Nations has struggled to address on the other hand there is an unwavering support for Israel from the US and its allies what direction is the global order heading in and what's the future of global peace and security To delve into this complex issue, we are honored to have esteemed guest Mr. Hussain Hakani with us, who is a journalist, an academic, a writer, and needs no introduction. Mr. Hakani, thank you so much for joining us. What's your opinion on this current disarray in the global order? Uh, although what is happening in happening in Gaza is a, a tragedy, uh, its biggest impact is going to be on the region. and on israeli politics not mm-hmm. necessarily on uh, the politics within the united states and nor would it change america's position uh, very much uh, america has for years argued that their solution to the israeli palestinian conflict is the creation of two states that was the us's position in 1948 that is the position of the united states in 2024 what has changed is how the palestinians looked at it they refused to accept two states for many many years and how the israelis look at it where the israeli right wing led by prime minister netanyahu does not accept the idea of a two state solution at this stage so mm-hmm. therefore uh, this conflict and the fact that it has aroused so much emotion uh, among so many americans as well as europeans uh, will primarily impact how uh, the israelis who have always depended on support from the west uh, will react uh, to prime minister netanyahu's policies so the tragedy is unfolding it will continue to unfold but at the same time in the end there is no choice but for prime minister netanyahu to step down eventually and when he does there will have to be some engagement between the representatives of the palestinian people and the leaders of israel How do you look at the future of Abraham Accords? The Abraham Accords I think uh, are under pressure but they are not under threat. They are under pressure because the assumptions underlying the Abraham Accords were that they would lead to a two state solution. Uh, mm-hmm. Prime Minister Netanyahu's motives were different. He thought that the Abraham Accords were his opportunity to bypass the Palestinian question and still normalized with the rest of the arab world i think that the arab league summit in bahrain has made it very clear that 
while the Arabs may have slightly different opinions, some of them feel that they can engage with Israel, others feel they do not want to engage with Israel until the problem is solved. The mm-hmm. bottom line remains that the Arab world does want a Palestinian state. The countries that are part of the Abraham Accords play a very positive role in the sense that they have access, they continue to provide help to the Palestinians, for example, all the evacuations from Gaza of yeah. uh, injured and uh, ill people, uh, all the uh, economic assistance has flown from countries that are part of the Abraham Accords. Look, in the end, engagement works. Zero engagement is never a solution to any problem, nor is a constant refrain of using force. Eventually, there will have to be some kind of a solution and some kind of talks. This is a very, very tragic moment. And I think what it has done is it has brought back the Palestinian issues to center stage. And that may be the one positive outcome of all of this. So true. Uh, uh, What do you think of the public opinion uh, that is uh, shaping so differently on Palestine and Gaza within United States? Uh, It seems that the administration is not at all bothered about it, but there are American elections coming up. How do you look at that? The bottom line remains that the people of the United States, by and large, support Israel. Uh, They are divided between those who support Israel come whatever may, uh, which is a relatively smaller number, and those who believe that the, West, that, that the West owes it to Israel to keep it secure from elimination. And we mm-hmm. must remember, history doesn't start last year. It doesn't start today. It starts way back. And way back, there was a genuine uh, threat to the state of Israel because there were many more countries that did not recognize Israel than were willing to recognize it. Well, Now that 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 problem has been overcome, there are those in America, including American Jews, who feel that Israel needs to be flexible. It goes back. It needs to go back to Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin's attitude, which was that we can't have an Israeli state until we give the Palestinians a state of their own. And Mm -hmm. so that is what is playing out in the political arena. Now, as far as those who want a more radical outcome, They are out in the streets. And you and I both know that when people are out in the streets, that makes news. But news is not always what determines the course of events. So I do not think that the protests are going to change American policy. American policy is already somewhere uh, in the middle uh, from what it was a few years ago. President Trump, if he's reelected, he may be the one who might say for four years, We will ignore the Palestinians and support Netanyahu or Israel again. But after those four years, whoever gets elected will still come back to this reality. It goes back all the way to Harry Truman's recognition of Israel in 1948. If you hear that Mm -hmm. speech, he makes it clear that we will not let the Palestinians murder all the Jews and we will not let the Israelis murder all the Palestinians. So if that is the policy that goes back to 1948, I just don't see what the way out is for Israel's leaders who do not want a Palestinian state. Right. Where do you place Iran? Is it part of the problem, part of the solution, or it's something that is going to be there for Pakistan as a state that is our neighbor? We have litigation issues with the neighbor. We have security issues with that neighbor, and U.S. is involved as well. How do you look at it? Well, look, Iran and Pakistan is a very different subject because next door neighbors, you have to learn to figure out how to live with them, even if you have disagreements and conflicts with them. But Iran in its current configuration is increasingly a global problem. It's a country that does not get along with most of its neighbors. Uh, Look at its neighbors, Turkey, uh, uh, the Arab world, uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan. Who can you say is completely at ease with what the Iranian radical regime wants. Here is the problem with anybody who takes too radical a position. Yeah, anybody who takes too radical a position has very hardcore supporters and some very hardcore enemies. But a lot of people basically want that problem to be solved. So Iran will remain a troublemaker. It Mm -hmm. remains a problem because it uses proxies against Arab governments and Arab regimes. And nobody feels comfortable with that. Is uh, on Israel. It's the last major country with a military uh, uh, with military power 
that believes that Israel should not exist and talks about eliminating Israel, the more that the more they do that, the less international support they have. Now there are, right. as I said, there are there are always radical people who believe in radical solutions. There are people who believe, oh yes, so and so should be wiped out. So, but then whether those are right wing people in Israel who want to eliminate the Palestinians or left wing people in the rest of the world who want to is- eliminate Israel, they will never have the support, the sympathy of a vast majority, which feels very uncomfortable with such violent solutions. So Israel. Uh, will continue to look at Iran with suspicion until Iran goes back to where it was under the Shah, not under the Shah in that sense, but a country that recognized Israel and that had good relations with Arab countries. It has its own attitude, it had its own arrogance, but it did not have the attitude that it does now. And so Iran Uh will continue to be seen as a problem, whether it is a problem problem or not, of course, will depend on how you think. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mr. Hussain Haqqani, for joining us. And this wraps up this epicenter.